Recently I watched this video from Great Scott where he basically miniaturized a small converter which I think was for battery management or something like that. That got me thinking I want to try to make a buck converter that's as small as possible. Now first things first, I'm not going to try to compete with this project because it's two different circuits. And I also don't think he mentioned what the size and the maximum power was, so I don't really have any metrics to compete with. So I'm just going to use his video for inspiration. So as I mentioned, this is going to be of a buck topology. And don't worry, I'm not going to start talking about how buck converters work. I'm sure everybody knows that on YouTube basically. It's like full of videos now. Instead, I'm going to talk a little bit of the controller IC, how that works, because it's a little bit different than a traditional pulse width modulation. Then I'll quickly look at the other components used, and I'll talk a little bit about the process of designing the circuit. First of all, let's talk about the MOSFET. This is going to be a P-channel. It holds up to 60 volts, drain the source, and its on resistance is about 50 milliohms. The input capacitance is relatively low, so it should make for faster switching, and also the rise and fall times are pretty low. By the way, I'm going to use all SMD components just to make things use as little space as possible. I'm going to order all my components from DigiKey because I've been happy with them in the past, but this is not sponsored by them in any way. Next is the controller IC that does all the switching and whatnot. Not. And this is a little bit particular. It's the LM25085 from Texas Instruments. The way this works isn't with the traditional pulse width modulation control, but it's with a constant on time control. Basically what this means is that we have a fixed period of on time and then what changes is the off time. So basically on the output the voltage changes when it turns on because it starts rising and once it turns off the voltage will start falling because we draw current from the output and the capacitor starts discharging and when this voltage goes under a certain threshold this triggers the controller to turn on the MOSFET and have more current flow through the inductor. This also means that the frequency is not going to be constant. For higher loads the frequency increases and for low loads the frequency decreases, which is good because at least we have fewer switching losses. Okay, so let's take a look at the functional block diagram. Okay, no, I'm kidding, we're not gonna do that. Moving on to the other components. The only slightly important things that we have left are the inductor and the diode. For the inductor, I'm going to choose this one, which is a 33 micro Henry, so relatively high inductance for the size especially. It's obviously SMD, its shape is almost a perfect cube with six and a half millimeters on each side basically. Its saturation current is 3.2 amps so we're definitely going to stay under that and the DC resistance is about 75 milliohms. So if we want to calculate what the maximum power loss is going to be we can do this quickly. The last thing is the diode, which is going to be a Schottky one. I tried getting the lowest possible forward voltage one. It's going to be a 15 volt reverse voltage. So this is going to limit our input voltage. The maximum average forward current is 4 amps or 3 depending on the temperature. And I don't think there's much else to say for this stuff. So at this point we can move on to the circuit diagram and check that out and see how it works. Alright, so here's the schematic as you can see. I'm not going to talk about all the details of this stuff just go over the basics and if you want to have more information on how I calculated the stuff I'm gonna link it in the description so you can have all the formulas you need. RT on the left is just a resistor that determines how long the MOSFET stays on so indirectly it determines the switching frequency. Then the R80J in conjunction with the resistance of the MOSFET while it's on is going to determine what the current limit is Basically, there's a current limiting feature of this IC that lets you limit the output current. The last particularity of the circuit is the network with R3, C1, and C2. And these are needed to add ripple to the feedback voltage. And this is because the IC uses the ripple on the output to determine when to turn the MOSFET back on. But since we don't want any noise on the output, we just want a steady voltage, we have to artificially add this ripple. Okay, so at this point it's time to design the PCB. I'm not gonna really talk much about it. Here you can see I made two versions of the PCB. One is bigger and all the components are on one side. I'm gonna do this because I have to order all the components and I've never used them before. And so this basically means that I have to nail it on the first try and that's usually not that easy. So if I directly make the tiny circuit and something doesn't work, troubleshooting is gonna be awful. So first I'll have the big one work and then once I see if it works and what to change, I can try to apply the same corrections to the small one. But I'm gonna order them together so it's not like I can correct too much. 
Here's the 3D view. You can see obviously there's a big difference between the two. And I guess it's time to order them. The last thing I do before ordering a PCB is to always check it with the online Gerbil file viewer, which is a free tool provided by today's sponsor, PCBWay. After that, I place the orders, and I think I'm gonna make these red this time just to switch things up. And you can see it's just six and a half bucks for five PCBs, so great prices. So after confirming the order, I got the package in the mail just a few days later, and it's time to check out the PCBs. While designing these, I was a little bit afraid because I was getting warnings of the pads for some footprints being too close, just 0.2 millimeters spacing between them. But apparently that wasn't a problem. As you can see here, the copper traces are looking really good. So if you're looking for great quality PCBs at low prices and great customer service, head over to PCBWay.com and order your PCBs today. So now it's time to get to building this thing. And first thing we do is obviously cover the pads with a solder paste. I did this manually with a syringe and honestly I thought it was going to be easier. Instead I made a little bit of a mess, but in the end it worked out. So after our PCB is covered in tiny bird poops, we can apply all the components. And after that's done, we have to melt all the solder either with a heat gun or some kind of a hot plate. And the result is pretty satisfying, I'd say. So now it's time to test the circuit and see if it works. And we can see that the output is a pretty steady 5 volts. At first glance, the output noise seems very, very high, but actually this is because of bad probing. And no, it's not a cheap excuse. If we probe this with a very short ground lead, we can see that the result is a lot better. In fact, with two channels of the oscilloscope here, we can see the same identical output but probe differently and you can see that the noise is very different. The difference here is because the big ground loop that's created with the long lead picks up interference from the switching either capacitively or magnetically because of the loop. Now to briefly discuss the two problems I've had. The first one, as you might have noticed, the MOSFET is on crooked and this is because I actually screwed up the footprint. This seems to be a recurring problem on my side. In fact, this is probably the third time I've made the mistake and I'm not at all happy about it. The second problem is one that I haven't been able to fix so far and it's that when the input voltage goes above maybe 11 or 11 half volts, the output kind of falls and the switching just starts cutting off randomly and I'm not exactly sure why. It seems like something might be triggering some kind of limiting. I searched a little on the internet and someone on a forum said there was the same thing happening to them with the same controller I see and it's due to the switching noise and that they solved it using an RC snubber across the diode. I tried this and it did improve it slightly. The threshold at which the problem was occurring went up by about 1 volt but I'm not at all satisfied with this solution because the input voltage should be able to go to about 42 or 45 volts and 12 instead of 11 isn't at all a good result. So I'm gonna move on to making the small version and testing it because any solution I come up with doesn't seem to work. So here's the PCB with all the components soldered onto it and we can go ahead and connect it to power and attach a load to its output. The first thing I noticed is that the problem of the output voltage cutting off really doesn't happen or at least it seems like it might be happening at about 15 volts on the input. The fact is I can't really get to that value or go above it because diode 1 breaks down at 15 volts. So I guess that's good because it means that it works on the whole range that I designed it for. Another thing that surprised me is that it really doesn't heat up even with more than an amp on the output. So this calls for an efficiency test. I'm going to do it with the same output load but varying the input voltage between 10 and 12 volts and just make two measurements because the process is pretty tedious so I'm going to be lazy here. And obviously the measurements aren't perfect because I'm using some analog current meters and this and that but they should be good enough to give an idea of how well it works. And I was really surprised to see that it actually gets up to 95% efficiency which is definitely not what I was expecting. Again these measurements aren't actually perfect though so keep that in mind. And the last test is to see if it can actually deliver 10 watts on the output. So I'm gonna have to draw two amps at least and see if it doesn't shut down or anything. And it looks like it's doing that perfectly well. So I have to say I'm really happy with it in the end even though I kind of screwed up that footprint and the first version was showing that problem. Anyway I will probably be uploading the Gerbo files in the future but not right away because I want to correct the wrong footprint first. That being said I want to thank everyone for watching. Hopefully you found the video entertaining and informative and I guess I'll see you in the next one.